very much. Well, I'm very excited to be here. I'm, uh, my name is Lisa Davenport, and I'm with the Duke University Center for Tropical Conservation. Um, and uh, we've been doing this project for a couple years now. We're going to do something a little bit different um, from some of these other talks. It's not going to be highly quantitative. I'm going to focus on some of our field observations that we have come to think are somewhat critical to understanding what's going on in the birds' lives that helps explain our, uh, what we're seeing in the migrations. And I just want to point out my collaborators. This has been a, a team effort, a lot of volunteer effort with people all over uh, South America from Peru, Brazil, Bolivia, and Colombia. Um, just a very brief outline of this talk. So um, I do believe we're some of the only ones who are working in South America. So I'm going to speak a, a little bit briefly about the seasonality of um, the habitat and just give you an introduction to some of the different habitats in the Amazon. Um, we have for a long time been working on uh, particularly the aquatic species like the giant otter and the gorgeous uh, gami heron and uh, this is my only opportunity to put up some of these other species. So, I, um, <laughs> Our long-term field site uh, with these studies is the Manu National Park Peru at the Cochacashu Biological Station which my husband uh, has been working at for many decades. <clears throat> so, um, I'm of course going to talk about my main study animal, the Orinoco goose, and the multiple different types of habitats that it uses throughout the Amazon, uh, including some of the forested rivers, uh, the beaches, particularly in the meandering river uh, type, and also the oxbow lakes and savannas that it uses. Um, I will give you some tracking results. We are using microwave telemetry, uh, GPS, um, 30 grams. Um, uh, PTTs with the Orinoco geese and I'm although I'm saying that it's a talk about four countries in fact I'm going to focus on our work from Peru and Brazil um, that's in part because we in my abstract I said we would talk about some Colombian results uh, from what we did uh, we, tr we tagged two birds in Colombia in December of this of last year unfortunately there's been a, a terrible drought there so those uh, birds have not provided us data to compare so I'm particularly going to talk about two different families. We were able to tag both in Peru, two different families, and in Brazil. And I'm going to compare data um, from two families in Brazil caught in the same year, and then two families from Peru, but they were actually in different years. And hopefully I'll have a little bit of time at the end to talk about uh, the importance of the uh, findings of migratory connectivity for conservation. Uh, in the Amazon and uh, what we think is an uh, interesting finding about the importance of the high rates of predation of tropical uh, nesting birds to um, the, some of the life history features of these animals. So this is our, our uh, beloved study animal, the Orinoco goose. And um, <clears throat> I just wanted to point out that, uh, very briefly, that uh, if you do a quick and dirty, dirty search of um, um, of studies of migrant birds uh, for the Amazon, you see that we know very little about intra-Amazon and intertropical migrations generally. So if you do a search uh, for migrant birds, you'll get something like 90,000 hits on Google Scholar. If you look uh, then for an austral migrant bird, you'll get an order of magnitude less. <laughs> um, and then, interestingly enough, if you look for intra-African migrant bird, you'll get another order, order of magnitude less, about 637. But if you do then for intra-Amazon migrant bird, you will only get two results, one of which is our study on the Orinoco goose, <laughs> and the other of which actually isn't about a bird. It's about Hyman for some reason. So um, we do sometimes feel like we are working deep in the wilderness, both literally and figuratively. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so and this also sort of uh, shows that in terms of the number of studies on move bank currently, but it's also useful to show our field sites. So our main field site of Cochacashu Biological Station is right here in southeastern Peru. Uh, the area, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give away some of my secrets, where they're flying to uh, is this Llanos de Mojos, this white area in Bolivia right here. This is also one of our, our field studies in the Rio de Roa, Brazil, and then our Colombia field site. Uh, so a little bit more about the Orinoco goose and why we started up this study. Uh, in fact, um, we became worried that we were seeing a decline possibly in the Orinoco geese that we saw in Manu National Park. It is a critically threatened species for the country of Peru, although not globally. It's actually near threatened globally and in Brazil where there are better populations, more the center of its territory. 
Um, it's a very interesting species, though. It's considered the only true forest goose by some. Um, it's actually not a true goose. It's a uh, Padornidae. It's a shelled goose. Uh, but one interesting life history feature is that it is a cavity nester. So you can see on this photo here this huge broken off trunk that they are using to nest. And this is actually the only nest we have found in Manu. So uh, yeah, I think I skipped over a somewhat interesting number, which is there are probably less than 30 to 40 pairs in all of the Manu National Park. And that is the, all, the entire known breeding population for the country of Peru. They used to be common throughout the Amazon, but are heavily hunted. And so other populations that we know existed historically, say in Iquitos, have been hunted out and have not returned. <coughs> so the birds breed in the Manu National Park uh, in the dry season, which there is May to October, but they disappeared from the rivers each wet season when the beaches get covered um, that, and they feed on the beaches. I'll show you a photo of that shortly. Um, and they get covered by the flood waters. And so prior to our study, we had no idea where the birds are going. So it's very hard to understand the conservation needs of a species that you don't know where it is for half of the year. <laughs> that was one of the motivating factors. Another future threat for these birds and other birds who require beach habitats and aquatic habitats generally is um, very active planning to increase the dams in the Amazon. So this got cut off a little bit, but these, these pink dots show existing dams, but then the far greater number of orange dam um, dots are actually planned dams in our study area. And it's even worse if you look in Brazil in terms of the modifications they're planning to the hydrology of the country. So um, I also think from a, uh, for the purposes of this particular Congress, it's very interested in the environmental um, factors that, um, that um, underlie the migration causes. Um, South America is very interesting because of the fact that there's a wet season that is opposite in the northern um, to the southern um, part of the Amazon. And so this is a figure I like from Goulding's 2003 book, showing the monthly fluctuation of the Amazon River. So the uh, wet season here is June, July, whereas that's the dry season for us. So this is, our again, our Peru site. So for the, most of my sites are actually south of the equator. But the Amazon is integrating all these sources coming from the north and south and coming at different times. So it's a very complex calculus of when the water is high and low. And some of these levels vary very hugely, um, tens of meters of change for six months at a time. Um, at our field site, it is not strongly, at Manu, it is not that um, high of a change. And it's far more erratic. That's because we're up near the the base of the Andes, and so we are not getting that big flood of many sources. On the other hand, the Rio de Roa site that we're looking at is further down the Amazon, obviously, and has a more predictable longer period of flooding. So they're quite different in terms of um, how variable the, the beach habitat is for the birds. So it actually comes and goes a bit in, in our wet season, but it is just gone for six months in the uh, lower Rio de Roa. This is in the... And unfortunately, we don't have great data. The important environmental factor is, in fact, the flooding level. We don't really have great data on flood levels for a lot of these sites. This is some data we took, actually, for a different project of lake depths. And this just shows you, and we, we use the lake as a proxy for the river. These are ri lakes that are actually pretty well connected to the river most of the time. So whenever the river is up, they're going to also flood. And so these peaks are when um, there are rain events or flooding events. And so this is a wet season data set starting in November and ending about a year later. And it just shows that there are these heavy flooding periods and then uh, gradual declines in the water level. Uh, but it is highly variable, and this does allow the, the water to, um, or, or the beaches to reappear at some times of the year. In fact, one year in 2010, I wanted to study giant otter feeding in the wet season when the lakes reconnected to the river and they never reconnected that year because it was because it was just a very dry year. So I, I just wanted to show you some photos of the habitat and our four field sites. So this is uh, Mono National Park Peru, our main field site. And as you can see, it's a long meandering river. And the habitats that the geese are using are these beaches that form at the points. So the river is always taking away that side of the river but adding to this side of the river. So it's disturbed habitat, plants grow there, and the geese feed on the young plants growing on the beaches. <coughs> now, um, I'm 
I've already told you that the geese from Peru are going to Bolivia to a very different habitat, which is the savanna and wetland complex in the Llanos de Mojos, Bolivia, which is characterized by these strange square lakes that are all aligned in, the, in a very interesting geological feature. They are actually um, not changing seasons at all. This is wet season, uh, as it is in Mani, where they leave. This is uh, just a field site that we're going to be working at more, we hope, someday in Bolivia in this habitat. And there is an Orinoco goose right there. And, the <laughs> um, and it's a wonderful place to study water birds. <clears throat> so the other field site, so here is Peru and the Bolivian field site. So we learned in 2010 and 11 that this migration was going on between uh, in the wet season to Bolivia. And we have a friend who was working on extractive hunting in the Wakari Extractive Reserve in Brazil. And he reported a previously little known population of Orinoco geese in this area that was really quite a, a good number of birds, like a thousand birds, way more than we have in Peru to study. And you can see that the, if, if these birds, and he also found that they were leaving in November and nobody knew where, so we felt they had two options. One was to go north to Colombia, where there are also llanos, and they would find dry season conditions there, or to Bolivia. So we were very interested to know which direction they were going. There's um, also it's an interesting conservation story in that these beaches that the um, the geese are using are strictly protected for turtle eggs. So no one's allowed to go onto these beaches, and um, my colleague Olio Endo has shown that this has had a positive impact on the population of Orinoco geese. So here's just some scenes from the Rio de Roa, Brazil. Uh, it is like a little bit like Manu in that it's a meandering river, but it's much bigger and broader. Those are many kilometers longer and wider uh, in many forms. So this is the, the houseboat that we lived on when we did the work. Uh, these are the Orinoco geese in one of these side lakes. And this is just a, a, uh, some of the other birds in the beach habitat. <laughs> this is our Columbia field site, just briefly. This is the team that tried to catch, or did catch, some birds. And you can see it's cattle country, so it's more like the uh, Llanos de Mojos, Bolivia. <clears throat> and obviously, our goal was to use the satellite telemetry technique, because we, we do not really have the option to use GSM, we don't think, in this area. There's just not much of a cell phone network. <clears throat> Um, and as I said, this is not going to be particularly quantitative. I'm simply going to show you some comparisons that were just blind luck in that um, when we were observing the birds, we realized that both in Peru and in Brazil, we, um, we, were, we had tagged birds uh, who in one case uh, lost their young of the year and in the other case had not lost their young of the year. So I just want to show you some of the um, details of those migrations. And uh, I'm just going to show you some very simple comparisons of these outbound migrations with the local rainfall and moon phase, and then that uh, either loss or, or keeping of their young of the year. <coughs> so um, the, the first pair of geese that we tracked from Manu, we tracked in 2010, and we actually tracked them male and female together. Uh, we tracked them when they had five young who were already uh, flighted. And um, they they completed this migration to the Llanos de Mojos, Bolivia, in two distinct phases. So the first phase was simply to descend the Rio Manu and then the Rio Madre de Dios, stopping on river beaches over the course of an entire month. So, um, and then after that, they took a nearly straight line compass direction over to Bolivia. And let me just show you a little bit of that. So uh, here we tagged them on about October 27th. Uh, they took an entire month almost to go. So this is the area of the park. So once they reached here, this November 22nd, they reached the confluence of the Alta Madre, and that's about at the park border. So they then spent another couple weeks in an area here, uh, which is, uh, they're basically running a gauntlet where they could be hunted. They're outside of the protection of the park. And uh, you can see here an area of very heavy gold mining that is impacting the area, and also there are a lot of hunters in this area. But shortly after they, um, they reached the, the confluence of the um, Rio de las Piedras on November 30th, they stopped this month-long migration pattern that was following this river going east. And then they just went overland over the course of two nights. So they did more than 50% of their migration in that two nights. <clears throat> and then they stopped at a stopover for about two weeks until they went finally to an area just to the west of the Rio Mamare. 
<coughs> so I just want to compare that data set now to the 2003 female that we just had last year in July. So the pink track is the track I just, I just discussed a bit. Uh, the red track now is the bird we just are tracking actually still today. And uh, one of the, and so this is the bird that uh, we feel lost her young this year. The movements, we caught her at the nest, at that nest that I showed you previously on top of a tree. <laughs> and um, and um, she, she had very erratic movements shortly after we, um, we observed her at the nest. And we believed that she had lost her young by then. And so she left at around, on around October 15th. So if you remember previously, the other birds had not left the park until November 22nd or so and didn't arrive here till December. But she left October 15th and arrived in just two days. She did something a little different. She didn't actually use a straight line path like the other birds. She bounced off the Andes and then went over <laughs> to Llanos de Mojos. But she went to the exact same stopover area that the previous birds did. So this is known from geese that they often stage. And she has now been wandering around here, and now she's back in this area, so we think she's preparing to return, and so we're hoping to get her round trip migration. <clears throat> so just a little bit more on that stopover one. Um, uh, just to show you a little bit of a close-up of the area. So there are a couple lakes in the area, and at least the 2010 birds were doing a daily migration of about 10 kilometers. They were always feeding in that tiny little area and then spending the night on the lake. And our, our bird currently is using this lake for the night, but then feeding more over here. So, it's, so they are joining up, uh, it seems like, particularly at night with other birds. So one of the things with the 2013 female, who we called a den after a, a friend's daughter, um, <coughs> is that when she chose her, migration, her, her date to migrate, it corresponded with the first major flood of the year. This is data, thank you, from James Shepherd, <laughs> who uh, is now providing some of the first data from our very field site on uh, rain and um, wind and various factors. So it's at this data garrison site. And so uh, she timed it just as, just as this first storm front was coming through and rain levels uh, were increasing. So uh, James started up the weather station. This, is, this on here is week of the year, so 52 being December. And so th this was on about the 40th week of the year that she migrated, and that corresponded with these first big floods. <coughs> so um, this 2013 bird did a quick and early migration starting in mid-October, likely, we think, with a storm front. So she was choosing an optimal time to leave, uh, whereas the other family did not uh, seem to be as affected by the weather system. Uh, some other observations we were able to make on it on a den was um, simply that uh, we had a, <laughs> a field assistant climb and look at into the nest and take some photos and we observed at least three pairs who were fighting for this cavity. It was a very preferred site and the female was actually sitting on about 20 eggs at the time so they are <laughs> uh, multiple females seem to be nesting in the area and our female did seem to stay in the nest after we tagged her for about a week. We got no data from her and then she left the area. But we don't know exactly what happened socially, but something happened, and we don't think she was caring for the, for the chicks after that. So then, uh, similarly, in Brazil, only in this case, we had um, a pair with young and without young um, in the very same year. So we first tagged our uh, male on September 5th here near the town of Boana, and then went upriver and tagged another animal at, near the town of Carousel. <clears throat> and if you look closely, you might be able to see this is the antenna of the animals at Carousel. And so we stayed a couple days to make sure they were okay, and they, um, they seemed to be doing well, and uh, the family was all intact. But we went, well, let me go back actually to the previous slide. So then we went back down river to the Bawana site, and we're also observing them a week later. And I found that I could find the birds, and I could see the same family. But previously, where I had been seeing the parents interact and the young come in, that the young were no longer there. We had also observed some predation of young Orinoco geese at the site by great black hawks. So we believed that that was the likely cause of um, this bird's loss. And so, as you can see, this is already showing you the data. Uh, this bird went south and also went to Llanos de Mojos, Bolivia, after losing the chicks. Um, 
in early October, whereas this bird, who we believe kept the chicks, um, we did not ever see a migration, uh, but unfortunately the data stopped around November 14th. So we don't have the actual date that the bird would have left, but we know it, uh, there's at least that much of a difference. So in both cases, these, these birds are having um, a much delayed return. Now note the, the big difference is that in Peru, they have a river system that is sort of, that they can follow slowly with young um, birds with them. Whereas in um, Brazil, they do not have the option of following any river system that's of use. They have to cross these major rivers that are going the opposite direction from where they want. So that is um, a, a, an interesting note. So, <clears throat> so here from the Bawana bird who left in early October, um, we were actually fortunate it did it quickly in 36 hours, a uh, distance of approximately 800 kilometers. It then spent some time again in the um, area of Guanas de Mojos. This is the location of Barbara Azul. And we were also able to get the return migration on that bird finally. <coughs> so um, this is just to show that, again, the week is on the x axis. And um, some data from uh, the government on rainfall. It's not so obvious that the bird in Brazil was choosing an optimal, necessarily, with a storm front. Um, and this is just the time when the transmitter ended on the bird that stayed in um, in the Rio Juruá. So the other uh, the other sort of environmental factor that we thought might be uh, affecting the birds was the moon phase, but that was particularly from our bird in, um, in Peru that looked like it, was, it chose to migrate near or do that long distance um, jump around the phase of the moon. But we, we actually discounted this even in the, this case. And the subsequent birds also migrated without any moon effect. So this did not seem to be an important um, feature in determining the timing of their migration. So this is just a map showing basically all of the data together the pink and the red, and then this is the full migration, with the dark blue just being the return migration of our bird from uh, Brazil. And a nice thing, as I told you, we, have, we had some strong migratory connectivity to one stopover from the Peru birds. We did not see all the birds interacting on similar sites, but this bird did go back to its exact beach where we tagged it in 2000, uh, um, yeah, in September, the previous year. How much time do I have? None. OK. It's OK, because I've told you the most important thing. So the timing and duration, we think, is, is it's sort of the reverse of the usual story, that often we think that um, birds are going to time their migration early in order to get to the breeding season. But in, this, but in the case of the Orinoco goose, it looks like reproduction is actually determining their schedule of migration to offsetting it almost two months, seven weeks to eight weeks comparing one data set from another. So I think that's a fairly significant shift based on um, their need to, to be with the young and teach them the migration. So it's going to be particularly interesting, I think, in birds like the Orinoco goose that are social um, and are teaching their young. But I think the most important point here is that tropical birds are generally facing higher predation rates uh, on the breeding grounds than temperate birds. Some of our colleagues, such as Scott Robinson are showing huge um, predation rates of tropical birds in the Peru area. And we think that this is driving numerous aspects of their biology and then this migration timing. So in particular, of course, I'm talking about their uh, requirement to have cavities for nesting. And so we think that um, this requirement to have cavities is part of the explanation of why the birds are undertaking this partial migration from Bolivia. Because in fact, these birds are leaving a what is already a breeding population in Bolivia. And some of them are leaving to Brazil and Peru, and some are staying to breed there, probably due to cavity limitations. So we're doing some nest box studies to prove this. They are piling into them in Bolivia, as you might expect. But I don't really have time to talk about that. This is, I'm sorry for this. This is sort of ugly. But this is just to show um, the results of our Columbia work, which unfortunately ended this year, although uh, as a result of this terrible drought that was going on through March. So I won't say too much else except uh, to point out that the conservation implications of being able to show some of the site fidelity in particular for this species we think is important. Um, fortunately, there is some, I mean, the, the Llanos de Mojos has been, you know, we're showing that it's a critical habitat. 
Unfortunately, we're beginning to be able to show some particular stopover areas that are important for this species and for the critically endangered Peru population. Unfortunately, the area that they're using is actually this hole in the new Ramsar designation. And so they are not using our data at this point. <laughs> um, and also, another problem with this is that all of these are departmental and municipal level protected areas. This is the only national park in the whole Beni. And most of these have absolutely not a single park guard or any protection, and it's 98% protected or 90% private land, um, and more and more conversion to rice and such that would affect the animals. So I'll just thank you for your attention, and uh, I guess maybe take questions later. <laughs> thank you.